Ask them how it is. Okay, uh, Jeff, Buckteen Carol, uh, Sharnay 108, please tell me if the volume's better. Uh, we did reboot it. We want to know that everything's come back on time, uh, back up uh, properly. So pop in there to the chat room. Great. Okay, thank you so much. So as I was saying earlier, we want to wish a happy Akkadasi conclusion or those of you that are in the far eastern part of the world, Australia, India, far parts of the Middle East, I hope you enjoyed your Akkadasi. It's a wonderful day. I was just reading in a book called Vaishnava Etiquette as we were waiting to begin uh, some information about observing Akkadasi and how important it is. So keep your Akkadasis marked on your calendars. So tonight we have an uh, interesting topic. We want to discuss a little background though. Um, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appeared in this world for many purposes. One of these purposes, of course, was to understand and develop the mood of Prema Bhakti. And in the development of that mood of Prema Bhakti, there are many contributing factors to what brought that about. I mean, aside from the fact of his own divinity as the Supreme Personality of Godhead, contributing a factor since he was setting the example as a devotee that brought about this level of love of God that manifested in him. Now, one of these contributing factors is what we're going to discuss tonight, and that is Jaidev Goswami. Uh, Jaidev Goswami appeared some 300 years before Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, and this is very uh, instrumental. It's uh, quite significant. Now, how do we know that Jaidev Goswami was a contributing factor in the mood of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Well, if we turn to the authorized biography of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, namely the Chaitanya Charitamrita of Krishna Das Kavi Raj Goswami, we will see that there's information given quite early on in the book. Um, Adi Lila, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Adi Lila, chapter 13, text number 42. In that text, there's some very interesting information. I want to read the actual text here. This is from Srila Prabhupada's translation. Text 42. The Lord used to read the books of Vidyapati, Jayadev, and Chandidas, relishing their songs with his confidential associates like Ramananda Roy and Sarup Damodar Goswami. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. Jayadev was born in the reign of Maharaj Lakshman Shain of Bengal in the 11th or 12th century of the Shaka era. His father was Bojadev and his mother was Vamadev. For many years, he lived in the Navadweep area, then the capital of Bengal. One of his famous books, the Gita Govinda, is full of transcendental mellows and feelings of separation from Krishna. The gopis felt separation from Krishna before the Rasa dance, as mentioned in the Srimad Bhagavatam, and the Gita Govinda expresses such feelings. So, right early in the pastimes of Mahaprabhu, Chaitanya Charitamrita, we find it's mentioned about his um, appreciating the books of Jayadeva Goswami. Uh, the next bit of information we find in the Chaitanya Charitamrita is Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's pastimes with Ramananda Roy. Now, you'll remember when Lord Chaitanya had taken sannyasa and had gone to live in Puri, he decided to tour South India. And at the behest of Sarva Bhoma Bhattacharya, who had spent some time instructing the Lord, um, feeling it for his own benefit, uh, the Lord's that is, he advised Lord Chaitanya that you should visit Ramananda Roy. Ramananda Roy is a very, very advanced devotee and you will gain great insight as a result of your conversations with him. So this showed two things at one time. It showed Sarva Bhoma Bhattacharya's um, appreciation of the Lord uh, as an individual for him to assist in his development spiritually. And it showed his appreciation of Ramananda Roy. Of course, this is at a time when Sarvabhama Bhattacharya is still somewhat covered over by Yogamaya, not Mahamaya, but by Yogamaya for the sake of the pastimes of the Lord. So he encourages him, when you go to South India, you find this Brahmin Ramananda Roy. So, Lord Chaitanya found Ramananda Roy and began to discourse with him. Uh, it's interesting because we find Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 
so-called learning from Ramananda Roy's teachings. Yet Ramananda Roy says, my dear Lord, I don't know why you're asking me questions because I'm answering only as you allow me to answer. So Ramananda Roy was acknowledging this, but nonetheless, this was the mood of the pastime. And so Lord Chaitanya asked him many different questions, and each question would, if you will, ratchet up the ecstasy, the devotional level a bit more. And he would ask him about different topics, and he inquired from him. He said, among the many songs, which song is considered to be the actual religion of the living entities? Ramananda Roy answered to him, he said, that song that describes the loving affairs of Radha and Krishna, that is the highest of all songs and superior to all others. Now, in the purport to this verse in Majulila, this is uh, Majulila, I mentioned chapter 8, verse 250, Srila Prabhupada mentions that Jayadev Goswami's songs, particularly his song Gita Govinda, fall into this category. Hmm. Now, it's also equally important at this time to remember that the conversations between Ramananda Roy and Lord Chaitanya at this point are um, highly uh, advanced. Um, it's as we hear the word a lot now, Rasik Bhava. Very, very high level of devotional service that Prabhupada says in the purport there again is not meant for the ordinary persons. So we should understand uh, that it's very important. As a matter of fact, in the purport to the first verse that I read, in Adi Lila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Prabhupada quotes him with a specific warning, which I'll read. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur comments in this connection that such feelings of separation as Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu enjoyed from the books of Vijapati Chandidas and Jayadev are especially reserved for persons like Sri Ramananda Roy and Sarup Damodar and others who might be Paramahamsas, men of the topmost perfection, because of their advanced spiritual consciousness. Such topics are not to be discussed by ordinary persons imitating the activities of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, for critical students of mundane poetry and literary men without God consciousness who were only after bodily sense gratification, there is no need to read such high standards of transcendental literature. Such persons will simply commit offenses due to their misunderstanding. So, here we have a warning from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati uh, to be very cautious about trying to enter into this mood that Lord Chaitanya and Ramananda Roy experienced. So, uh, we continue on. Uh, the final mention of Jayadev Goswami in the Chaitanya Charitamrita is in the Antialila. And in the Antilila chapter 20, verses 67 and 68, we find here the Lord is beginning to wrap up His manifest pastimes here in this world. And in wrapping up these pastimes, He begins to dive very deep into a secluded and highly advanced level of devotional service, feeling of separation. Actually, uh, the verse says, deeper the millions of oceans was the mood of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Wow. And in that verse, it mentions in the verse by Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswami, and we remember that this section of the Chaitanya Charitamrita is taken from the notes of Raghunath Das Goswami, who was there mm. in Puri at the time, and Srub Damodar, mm. that there were four writings which enhanced this mood of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The first was selected verses from the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, the pastimes of Krishna and the Gopis. The second was Ramananda Roy's Jagannatha Balabhanataka, pastimes of Lord Jagannath. Mm. The third was Bilbamangala Thakur's Krishna Karnamrita, and by now you may have guessed the fourth, Jayadev Goswami's Gita Govinda. So, this is a, uh, a very, very important writing is Gita Govinda, and these are very, very important um, topics of Jayadev Goswami. So, you know, we might ask, who is this Jayadev Goswami? I mean, that would be the proper thing to do if he had such a contributing effect in the mood that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu developed, and if he's, his teachings were considered by Ramananda Roy to be part of the collection of the highest songs of this world. And we all know there are many, many songs in this world.
Mm -hmm. We were just discussing prior to this the endless uh, array of assault on the ears of mundane musical topics that are out there. No matter where you go and what you do and what building you walk into, it's all there. And so the highest are the ones we aspire for. So who is this Jayadeva Goswami that has written these? Now, Jayadeva Goswami is said to have appeared in the 11th or 12th century, sometime in that crossover period between the two. And um, there are some different opinions about where he made his birth, but the most common held and accepted uh, understanding is that he appeared in the village of Kendu Bilva. Now, Kendu Bilva is in the Birbam district of Bengal. Now, this is an interesting thing in itself. Actually, um, Kendu Bilva is about 20 miles south of, uh, of the Birbam district of Bengal um, on the banks of the Ajaya River. And uh, it's stated that Jayadev in that area found as a young child the deities of Radhamadava that he would worship all throughout his life, in his uh, youth, in his Grahasta life, and in his later years. And um, his, as we read earlier, his father's name was Bojadev, and his mother's name was Vamadev. Now, Jayadev himself lived for a very long time in Navadweep. And this was when it was... Uh, the reign of the king of Bengal, Lakshman Sain, and he made his home not far from there. He's actually the uh, court poet. This is uh, an interesting point, I think, that, you know, someone who 300 years later would make such a, con a, con uh, a significant contribution to the life and mood of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the way he was trying to develop his teachings would have lived in Navadwi prior to Mahaprabhu's living there. I think that this is, uh, you know, something that we can see a wonderful connection there. So at the time, the chief scholar in that court uh, was uh, Govardhanacharya. And uh, Govardhanacharya was a scholar, and the poet of the court was Jayadeva Goswami. So this is a very, very amazing time, we can imagine. Uh, the... Um, Bhaktivinoda Thakur writes in the Navadvip Dham Mahatmya that Lakshman Singh was very, very uh, delighted to hear the hymns of Jayadev Goswami's Das Avatar. Now, if you've been to Mayapur and traveled, you'll know that not far from our Mayapur Mandir is the site where Jayadev Goswami is said to have written the Das Avatar prayers. I actually was fortunate enough to collect some dust from that place and have it in a small container. So uh, when the uh, king, uh, Lakshman Sain, heard this, he was very, very delighted by this. He thought it was wonderful. And so Govardhanacharya informed the king that it was Jayadev who's written this. So then the king became very desirous to meet Jayadev Goswami. And so incognito, King Lakshman Sain went to Jayadev's house. And when he saw him, he noticed right off that this Jayadev is a wonderful personality. He possesses all saintly qualities. He's uh, greatly powerful. He has a wonderful spiritual potency. So he became very impressed and very attracted by Jayadev. And uh, the king then went forward and revealed his identity. You know, let him know that I am such and such. And he asked him, he said, I'm inviting you to please to come and live in the king. Be the poet. I've heard this Das Avatar prayer that you've written. And... Prabhupada, of course, liked to sing this song very much. And Srila Prabhupada gives a very, very wonderful purport. We were just listening to it at home the other day, describing each of the different avatars. And Prabhupada speaks very nicely about this prayer of Jayadev Goswami. So, the king heard this and was very impressed and thought he must be a great poet. So he invited him that you should come and live in the uh, royal palace with me. But at that time, Jayadev Goswami was leading a very renounced life. And he didn't really want to live in the royal palace because as you might imagine if you're going to live in the royal palace there's not going to be much renunciation <laughs> the king's eating very opulently so he's going to come and invite you to eat with them and you're going to eat very opulently the king has a, a wonderful quarters he's going to be sure that his servants and his court uh, associates have wonderful quarters so there would have been no question of this so Jaide was not willing to take up that so he told the king he said I prefer to live separately like this. So I, I'm not really so much interested in living in the environment of the palace and all the wealth and everything that was there. So 
the king was, you know, disappointed to say the least. Uh, I mean, you know, he had, uh, he had, because he was uh, devotionally minded, he had decided that, you know, having this great poet of spiritual qualities living there, and there'll be wonderful spiritual sound vibration. So, although disappointed, he suggested that, uh, why don't you take up residence in Champahata, uh, Champahati. This is a, a, a village, just so you've heard us mention this place in some of the other lives of the Vaishnavacharyas. Um, it's just near the palace, and it's suitable for a person who would like to leave a renounced life. It's a very simple village, yet it's close enough that you, know, you can be available. So uh, he promised that you know, if you do that, then I will never come and disturb you, and you can simply come and see me as you like, or if I ask, you know, send a message, you know, I won't ever come like that anymore. So, Jaidev Goswami agreed. All right, this is a good idea. You know, actually, Jaidev Goswami wanted to go and live in Jagannath Puri. Mm -hmm. He said, I'm going to leave here and go to Puri, uh, so I can't really live in the palace with you. So, the king's idea was for him to stay in Champahati. So, um, he was stayed there, and the king arranged to have a nice cottage built for him. And uh, beautiful gardens, uh, you can guess by the name, Champahati, there's beautiful gardens of Champak trees there. Now, uh, I, I have the good fortune to have Champak trees at my house, and the coloring on Champak trees is so beautiful. Such an amazing color, all the different uh, shades and styles. In this part of the world, uh, because we're a bit tropical here in Florida, they grow quite commonly, quite easily. So the coloring is beautiful. What to speak of, they have a very fragrant smell. So this was the reputation of this uh, place. And um, uh, this is also the place where later devotees, uh, uh, one devotee of Mahaprabhu had a vision of him you know, uh, staying there. So uh, anyway, Jaidev Goswami settled there. And uh, this is where he first established the very wonderful worship for Radha Madhava. He um, combined uh, the beauty of their form with all the beauty of the Champak flowers and uh, this reminded him of Garanga Mahaprabhu. He had this vision um, because in later times Mahaprabhu would appear and this is a vision that he had there of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and so the Champak flowers and the decoration of his deeds and all this is just very very wonderful, very very nice. So, after Lord Chaitanya gave Jayadev Goswami this vision, right, it, it actually mentions earlier, <coughs> excuse me, that although Jayadev Goswami appeared before Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu imbibed himself through the writings of Jayadev Goswami for that mood of love of God. So, in this way, um, the connection was there, as I say, living in Navadweep, the connection of being in that same area of Mahaprabhu revealing himself to him there at Champakahati and uh, uh, the vision that he had. So all of this and then manifesting himself through the writings of Jayadeva Goswami, that mood, which later enhanced Mahaprabhu's mood it, uh, near the end of his life. It's very, very wonderful the way this all combines like that. Excuse me. So after some time of living there and uh, performing his duties there, uh, Jai Dave was instructed by the Lord that he should go to Jagannath Puri. Now, um, <clears throat> Jai Dave Goswami went and resided in Jagannath Puri, and uh, there he engaged as the court poet and the king of Orissa as well. So this was his nature wherever he went, and um, he would write poetry and uh, songs and glorification of Lord Jagannath in this way. Now, while he was living in Jagannath Puri, a very amazing thing happens. <coughs> Lord Jagannath himself ordered Jaidev Goswami to marry. It's quite an amazing story. Um, the woman that he married, her name was Padmavati. And uh, so the way it's told, the way the story is explained, is that there was a Brahmin who was without any offspring, without any children, and uh, worshipped Lord Jagannath for many, 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 many years with the hope of having a son. 
So finally, in due course of time, his wife conceived and gave birth to a daughter. And they named her Padmavati. So when she was of marriageable age, the Brahmin brought her before Lord Jagannath. And he said, I'm offering my daughter to your lotus feet. This is a very interesting thing because this is a mood of seeing the Lord as the proprietor of everything we have. <clears throat> Sometimes you'll hear the stories that in the old days, and I mean the very old days, like in the early 60s, when Srila Prabhupada, uh, the mid-60s, when Srila Prabhupada started uh, our Hare Krishna movement, that devotees understood that everything had to be offered to the deity. So they would take their new blue jeans or their new shirt or whatever and put it in front of the altar as an offering to the deity to be blessed before they would wear it. So, this is the proper mood that a devotee should have, that everything I have is by the grace of the Lord. And everything I have should be offered to the Lord for His satisfaction. This is the, uh, here again, I was just reading in this book, Vaishnava Etiquette, and there was some discussion about offering prasadam, that everything one eats should be offered in the same way. So, this is the mood of this Brahmin, living in Jagannath Puri, he offered his daughter Padmavati to the feet of Lord Jagannath. And um, Lord Jagannath, this is the amazing way the Lord reciprocates with his devotees. Lord Jagannath said, I have a servant, his name is Jayadev. So, he has, uh, he's given up his family, he's given up everything and dedicated himself to chanting my names. So, you should go and give your daughter to him in marriage. Now this speaks of a very interesting point. The Lord spoke to this Brahmin. Now we've had the um, example and the instruction from Srila Prabhupada that if we worship the deities nicely and that if we serve the deities nicely that someday the deity will talk to us. Now at this stage of our devotional service I would say 99.9% .9 of us see the Lord as a statue. We may know in our hearts who he is, but we're not actually seeing the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Now, there may be some of us out there that are. But the point is that when our vision is purified, premanjana charita bhakti vilochanena, when our vision is purified with the salve of love of God, then the deity will appear as Brajendra Nandana, the son of Vrindavan, and will speak with us and instruct us. There's a wonderful story to this regards. When Prabhupada was in Dallas and taking Darshan of the deities, he turned to the Pujari at the time and said to him, So, what is the mood of the deity? Yeah. Pujari was kind of taken aback, kind of thought, what, what me? I, I'm supposed to know the mood of the deity? Prabhupada said, No, you're the intimate servant of the deity, therefore you know the mood of the deity. So, these types of activities, and then of course there's the wonderful story of Shakshi Gopal, when the old Brahmin was being served by the young Brahmin, then I'm going to condense it, and then he offered his daughter, and the young Brahmin said, no, this isn't possible. He said, no, we'll go before the deity, and we'll, I'll take this vow in front of the deity. And uh, so he, he took the vow, and then in due course of time, there was some uh, dissatisfaction by the family members, and so the deity was called on as a witness. So Shakshi, uh, so the young Brahmin went to the deity and said, My dear Lord, I need you to come and witness that you heard this promise. And the deity said to the young Brahmin, he said, But it's so far away. How am I supposed to get there? You expect me to walk? And the Brahmin said, My dear Lord, if you can talk, certainly you can walk. So in this way, the Shakshi Gopal story goes that the Lord walked all the way to this place and bore witness to the fact. So at any rate, these pastimes of the deity are something we can hope to achieve. So in this way, the Brahmin, very pure-hearted, long-time servant of Lord Jagannath, went to Lord Jagannath and offered everything to him. Here's my daughter. She needs to be married. What do you advise? And Lord Jagannath said to him, you should take her and offer her hand in marriage to my servant Jaidev. Jaidev is a very renounced Brahmin. He's an expert poet. He's part of the court here. You should go and give to him. So the Brahmin took his daughter, introduced himself to Jayadev, and asked, My Lord Jagannath is sent me. And Jayadev, of course, Jayadev had no inclination. Jayadev was a renunciate. He was living a simple life in a thatched hut outside of the kingdom of the, pal uh, the, uh, the king's palace. 
And he had no uh, desire like this to get entangled. So the Brahmin told me, he said, no, but Lord Jagannath himself told me that this should be arranged. So, without another word, the Brahmin just left his daughter there and turned around and went away. This is a uh, quick marriage. <laughs> Here's my daughter, you're the husband, okay, goodbye. <laughs> the father was very happy to be relieved of that responsibility. Kanya Dan, it's called. Giving the daughter in charity like that. So, at any rate. So, Jai Dave kind of, um, you know, he found himself unprepared for the situation. He had no dealings with ladies and didn't have any, you know, I mean, he had no intention or inclination. And so, uh, he told the girl, um, well, tell me where you want to go and I'll take you there. And then I'll leave you there because you can't stay here. It's just not possible. So, Padmavati, she did what any young girl in that situation, any young girl, any woman would do, she began to cry. <laughs> and she began to cry these most sorrowful tears. My father who has brought me here to marry you, not on a whim, but on the order of Lord Jagannath. I heard the order with my own ear. You're my husband. You will now be my all in all. If you do not accept me, I will fall at your feet and die right here. You are my only hope, my Lord. You must accept me. This is her, her plaintive prayer, her crying. So the poet, Jayadev Goswami, was also a scholar, a soft-hearted devotee, and a follower of Lord Jagannath. And being told that this was the desire of Lord Jagannath, what was there left to do? So he accepted the Grihastha Ashram a householder. And in his household life, the deities he had since his youth of Radha Madhava were established and worshipped very nicely, both the husband and wife. Many places in the Chaitanya Charitamrita we find the instruction is given about deity worship in the home. We've spoken about this many times, but this deity worship in the home for the householders is essential. Because the nature of household life Relationship between husband and wife, relationship with children, acquisitions, acquiring things and uh, facilitating the desires of the children and giving them so many things. It's very easy to become sidetracked. It's very easy to lose our focus. The working has to be there and acquiring some finances and paying of the bills and all these different things. Very difficult. But if we have the deity in the home, we're reminded who is the Lord of the house and what is our position. Because as Prabhupada says, and the Shastra points out, that the Grahastha Ashram is a license for sense gratification. Some persons in this world, they have no interest in relationship with the opposite sex, any kind. Then there are those that are interested in that way, so the Grahastha Ashram is made available for that. But in that uh, activity, there is a tendency to think oneself the enjoyer. There is a tendency to think oneself the Lord and Master. To think oneself the proprietor of all one's possessions. So if one installs the deity in the home and worships the deity as the Lord of the home, as the master of the house, as the person who everything should be brought before, then it's actually very easy. One can take the uh, boga that comes into the house and offer it to the deity. There's that wonderful story of Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati when he was just Bhimal, mm -hmm. a young boy. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur brought mango to the home. And he took and said, oh, this one will be mine. And Bhaktivinoda mildly rebuked him. What? Fresh fruit has come to the home? And you're taking it first before the Lord? This is not proper. Mm -hmm. And from that day forward, Bhaktisiddhanta was a young boy. He swore he would never take mango. So much of an impression this had on him that the first everything should be offered to the Lord. Even we can include the Lord in our family activities. My dear Lord, we're going to, uh, you know, we can arrange, uh, uh, many devotees have swing ceremony in the yard. Take the Lord out, invite some devotees over, chant kirtan. Um, here in Alachua, so many grasses have so many wonderful deity worship programs going on. And they invite devotees to their home and have wonderful programs like that. Deity becomes the focus in this way. So, 
this is the importance of having the deity in the home, and this is the example we see that Jayadeva Goswami gave in the establishing of his household ashram with his wife Padmavati and the continued worship of his deities Radha Madhava. Now, there's uh, many stories, and there's one particular story about Jayadeva I'd like to relate. Um, this is later in Jayadeva's life. He was writing Gita Govinda, and he had come to a particularly sensitive section of the Gita Govinda. And this section describes Krishna's uh, relationship with the gopis headed by Srimati Radharani. So, as any of you that have done any type of writing, even just a simple Vyas Puja offering for your spiritual master, it takes some thought. It takes some focus. It takes some time. I was talking with a young boy in our community yesterday, and we were just discussing his education. He's in college and doing some studying, and he was explaining how he finds it difficult to study at home with the other siblings and the activities of the house. So he goes to the library and he studies there because there's a mood of quiet, of solitude, of being able to focus like that. So in this way, one has to be a bit contemplative when one's reading or studying or writing particularly. So Jayadeva Goswami, of course, was absorbed in this mood of Krishna's relationship with the gopis. And in one sense, uh, one section of it, he was writing how Krishna's uh, position was, um, how shall we say, subordinate to the gopis. And yet at the same time, Krishna's the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So this posed a dilemma. Now, Krishna is serving the gopis as their servant, but at the same time, he's the Personality of Godhead. So how is it possible that he is subordinate to the gopis? And so he had been inspired by this writing to put down that Krishna bows down and touches the feet of Srimati Radharani and takes the dust from her feet and puts it on his head. This was the mood that the song he was writing expressed. But again, he began to think, he hesitated. How can I write such a thing? How is it possible for me to put to paper, well, of course, palm leaf, the idea that Krishna is taking the dust of the Kopi's feet on his head. So he contemplated this, he contemplated this. So he decided, I'll take a break here. Some of you may have had this experience when you're writing a particularly difficult thing or trying to solve a particularly difficult problem. If you give it a break and go away and come back, you look at it with a fresh angle. So he decided, all right, I will leave. I'll go to the Ganga, because as I mentioned, he lived in Navadweep. Uh, so I'll go to the Ganga and I'll take bath there. And when I take bath there, then it'll give me a fresh perspective, fresh you know, mood, and then I'll come back and look at this again. So off he went to the Ganga to perform his uh, afternoon activities, take his bath and all like that. So, uh, and of course at this time, the activity of his wife, Padmavati, was to um, begin to cook the lunch to prepare for his uh, meal that would be offered, of course, first to his deities at Radhamadava, and then he would sit down and take Pasha. While he was away at the Ganga, Krishna came. Krishna, of course, is in the heart of all living entities. Krishna particularly says, I don't reside in Vaikuntha, I reside in the heart of my devotee. So, Krishna came, and he came in a very interesting way. He disguised himself as Jayadev Goswami. So he entered into the home. Now, of course, Mother Padmavati is a very chaste wife. If some man enters the house that is not her husband, she's going to take note of it. But her husband entered, oh, okay. Sometimes that happens after some years. The husband and wife just kind of take for granted the other's presence. It's not such a notable thing. Oh, someone has come in the room. Oh, yeah, they're over there. Yeah, like that. <laughs> so, in any way, um, Jayadev Goswami came in. She noticed he had come in and she continued cooking. So cooking was finished and she made the offering to the Lord. In the meantime, Krishna went into Jayadev Goswami's desk and he went over to the writing desk and he picked up the uh, sheaves of palm leaf and he came to the section where Jayadev Goswami had stopped and he picked up the quill and dipped it into the ink and he wrote the verse down 
which says that Krishna bows down to the lotus feet of Srimati Radharani. So then, this is the really amazing part, he could have just left, that was that. Then Krishna disguised his Jayadeva Goswami, went in and the wife called Prabhu, it's time for Prasad, please. And she put the Prasad down and Krishna sat down, disguised his Jayadeva Goswami and took the Prasad that Mother Padmavati had cooked. And then after finishing the Prasad, he stepped outside to throw away the plate, rinsed the hands, the water, because these things were not done in the house. Nowadays, of course, we have the garbage right in the house. But in those days, you would go outside and throw the garbage outside the contaminated place from where you've eaten, toss them outside and rinse the hands outside the house. Also, the toilet was not in the house. These were separate. Though in, in, in our American culture, we view it as a great step forward when the outhouse was brought inside the house indoor plumbing. This was a great advancement. Actually, it was not a very civilized step in advancement. At, at any rate, that being what it is. So, uh, Krishna went outside, disposed of the plate, rinsed his hands, and disappeared. So, due course of time, Jayadeva Goswami came back. He just finished his bath in the gong. He came back into the house. And uh, so he said to his wife, so, uh, Prashad, I'm ready? You know, you come home from school or from work or being out all day, the wife's cooking Pushat and come in, oh, Pushat, when's my Pushat? I'm ready. Oh, it'll be half an hour more. Ah, uh, 15 minutes. It's been ready for an hour. Where have you been? <laughs> like that. <laughs> it's been sitting there getting cold. Don't ask me to warm it up. <laughs> so, Jaidev Goswami said to Mother Padmaviti, so, where's the Pushat? And she said, uh, Prabhu, I just fed you. Jai says, well, what do you mean you just fed me? You just came in, you went into your room and wrote something, and then I fixed your prashadam, and you stepped outside, and now you're coming back in just a few minutes later and asking for prashadam again. <laughs> Maybe the sun has been too much for you. <laughs> well, Jai Dave was very astonished by his wife's story. I mean, after all, Jagannath told her to marry him, so he knows she's, you know, a very special person. So he went over to the book, and he saw that the line was there, and the ink was still wet. Krishna bows his head down to the lotus feet of Srimati Radharani. So when he saw this, he cried out, It is a miracle! It is a miracle! See right here, when I told you I was reluctant to write this verse, then I decided to go to the river and take bath, and come back and take prasad and then try again. And now I've come back and it has been written. Krishna has come and disguises me and written this verse himself, and you have served in Prashad. My dear wife, you were the most fortunate of people. Krishna has taken Prashad directly from your hand. So in this way, the conclusion of this section of the Gita Govinda was able to be brought about, even though Jayadeva Goswami himself was not able to do it. And Mother Padmavati got the uh, benefit of being able to uh, feed Krishna directly from her own hand. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, sometime later in his life, uh, Jayadev went to Vrindavan. And he took his deities of Radhamadava with him and set off for a very long journey. Now, it doesn't mention at this time whether his wife went with him or whether she had departed. The history of Jayadev Goswami is uh, a little sparse in some sections. But we kind of get the gist and the mood that he's on his own. Whether the wife has departed or gone back and he's taken sannyas or whatever, we don't know that exactly. Um, but Jayadev Goswami takes his deities to Radhamadava from Bengal and begins the long journey to Vrindavan. Now we can imagine, because we've discussed many times the journey Shivananda Singh took with the devotees going from Bengal to Puri. Hmm. Now I traveled one time overnight from uh, Krishnanagar to uh, Puri. And it's an overnight train ride. Boom, you're there. So walking every day, you can imagine, quite some distance. But now from Navadweep all the way to Vrindavan. So it was a very, very long journey. And once he arrived in Vrindavan, he went to Keshigat. Keshigat is one of the most wonderful and mystical places in Vrindavan. Nowadays we see Keshigat and maybe we don't see it like that. But it's a very, very wonderful place. So he resided there in the Keshigat area. Now keep in mind, this is uh, still during the decline period, you know, 300 years before Mahaprabhu. Between that time, Vrindavan was still, there was still some traces of Vrindavan. Uh, hadn't completely disappeared. 
So Keshi Gat was obviously there, and he went there and resided and worshipped his deities at Radhamadva, living there at Keshi Gat. Now the local residents, they would hear him daily singing his Gita Govinda to his deities of Radhamadva. And they became very, very attracted. So one wealthy merchant who was in the area there, he built a large temple there for the deities, and that is how they uh, came to be in the temple they were in. So, sometime later, it mentions that he then again returned to uh, Kendu Bilva uh, after living in Vrindavan for many years, and that he spent the rest of his life there um, worshipping the deities and performing his bhajan, and would take long walks to the Ganga and bathe there every day like that. And uh, there's one amazing story that one day, due to uh, feeling health, he wasn't able to make it to the Ganga. And so Ganga Devi uh, herself, she personally came to the village. There was a bit of a flood, if you would. Just like in Mayapur, Ganga comes to get Darshan of Radhamadava every year. Mm. Comes up out of the banks and into the Mayapur complex and brings all of her water with her. And so in the same way, uh, Ganga Devi went to the village of Kendudobo, Kindu Bilba, and uh, um, in this way, Chai Dev Goswami was able to bathe. Uh, uh, and eventually, the uh, story is that he departed from this world there uh, in uh, Kindu Bilba uh, on the banks of the Ganges. Now, there's one other story that's told. Um, actually, with Jai Dev's life, there are a few different uh, angles, but they're confirmed at the end by different acharyas. So, uh, another story is that uh, Jaidev finished his life in Jagannath Puri. That he went back to Puri and uh, stayed in Puri for some time and left his body there. And then the third version is that uh, he went back to Vrindavan and departed from this world there. However, as with the earlier instruction here, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, uh, he confirms that it is his opinion that Jaidev Goswami left this world in Jagannath Puri. This seems to go along with some of the other um, pastimes because it's said that when he was in Jagannath Puri in the later years, he arranged that every day the Gita Govinda would be sung to Lord Jagannath. Mm. And this was one of his um, final activities uh, in his life was to make this arrangement there. So, um, you know, in this way, and, and as far as his deities of Radhamadava, it's mentioned that the uh, deities were taken by the king of Jaipur, because uh, you may know the king of Jaipur saved many of the deities of Vrindavan during the different uh, difficult times of invasions, and he took those deities to a place called Gati, sometime after the disappearance of Jayadeva Goswami, and they're uh, still in the area of Jaipur being served there. So, um, as we mentioned, besides the Gita Govinda, another very famous book of Jayadeva Goswami's is the Das Avatar uh, uh, Gita. And uh, another one of his books was uh, called Chandraloka. These are three very famous books. Now, when he composed the Gita Govinda, he composed it in Sanskrit. And it describes throughout the story the loving affairs between Radha and Krishna, as one can imagine from the line that he had difficulty writing. And um, these songs are known to be of a particular type of rhythm and all that's very difficult to find still existing. And as a result, most of the times when we hear Gita Govinda, it's not in its original form. G uh, Jaidev Goswami wrote this following thing himself about his work, the Gita Govinda. I think it's a very nice thing to write here. That whatever is delightful in the varieties of music, whatever is graceful in fine strains of poetry, and whatever is exquisite in the sweet art of love, let the happy and wise persons learn that from these songs of Gita Govinda. Mm. So, in this way, he very much was desirous that the uh, devotees would be able to um, appreciate this mood of Gita Govinda. So, I'd like to finish here with two particularly famous songs of his, just the translations, because... Uh, I could sing a little bit, but not unless there's good musical accompaniment. <laughs> so, uh, the first song is called Hey Govinda, Hey Gopa, very well known by the devotees. O pleaser of the cows, O protector of the cows, O bearer of the finest hair, O husband of the goddess of fortune, you are very merciful to the fallen souls. Number two. 
You are supremely merciful, O Lord, supremely merciful, O Keshava, O Madhava, O Dina Dayal. Verse 3. Wearing bright yellow garments and a peacock feather upon your crown, you play the flute and make the sound of the flute sound like the name of Sri Radha. Verse 4. You are the cowherd boy that gives great delight, O Lord. The cowherd boy that gives great delight. O Keshava, O Madhava, O Dina Dayal. Verse 5. You take away our fear of being trapped on the wheel of repeated birth and death in this material world. And you are the splendorous killer of the demon Madhu, the destroyer of all tribulations. You are the supreme resting place for all souls. Now, before I read this second one, I'm just going to mention now that um, since we're near the end, if anyone has uh, any questions they'd like to pose through the chat room, if anyone has anything they'd like to bring up, I see we've already got one question to deal with here once we're finished, uh, but if you have anything you'd like us to discuss, feel free to post your questions there, and then uh, afterwards we will be able to uh, try and address those to the best of our ability. Uh, the second song is called Sutta Kamala. Also another very well known. O Lord, who rest upon the breast of the goddess of fortune. O Lord, decorated with swinging earrings. O Lord, who wears a charming garland of forest flowers. O Lord, Jayadev, one who defeats the demons. O Lord, hurry all glories to you. Verse number two. O Lord, whose ornaments are as splendid as the orb of the sun. O Lord, who breaks the cycle of repeated birth and death. O swan, who swims in the peaceful lake of the sages' hearts. O Lord Jayadev, O Lord Hari, all glories to you. O Lord, who defeated the poisonous Kaliya serpent. O delight of the people. O brightly shining sun that causes the lotus flower of the Yadu dynasty to bloom. O Lord Jayadev, O Lord Hari, all glories to you. Verse 4. O killer of the demons Madhu, Mura, and Naraka. O Lord who rise upon the back of Garuda. O Lord who enjoys pastimes among the dynasties of the demigods. O Lord Jayadev. O Lord Hari. All glories unto you. O Lord whose eyes are immaculate lotus petals. O giver of liberation from the cycles of repeated birth and death. O priceless treasure of the three worlds, O Lord Jayadev, O Lord Hari, all glories unto you. O Lord, who has become the ornament of the daughter of the Maharaj Janak. O Lord, who is victorious over all wicked demons. O Lord, who has defeated the ten-headed Ravana in battle. O Lord Jayadev, O Lord Hari, all glories to you. O Lord, as handsome as a fresh rain cloud. O lifter of Govardhan Hill, O Chakora bird who drinks the moonlight of Radharani's face, O Lord Jayadev, O Lord Hari, all glories to you. O Lord, we are bowing down before your lotus feet. O please think of us in this way, and kindly grant auspicious to us as we bow down before you. O Lord Jayadev, O Lord Hari, all glories to you. This song of the poet Jayadev brings transcendental happiness. It is auspicious, brilliantly effulgent, and the most wonderful of songs. O Lord Jayadev, O Lord Hari, all glories to you. So this is some of the uh, few stories that we have available about the life of Jayadev Goswami, a great source of inspiration and uh, manifestation of the heart of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu through his writings and thus a vehicle to the manifestation of the external mood of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu during his lifetime. So we'll take a look at the uh, chat room here. Let me see. Let's go back up. Bhaktin Carol is asking if Srimati Radharani wears tilak. Srimati Radharani, everyone wears tilak. There's just different types of tilak. Not all tilak is going to look just like this. There are some tea locks which would just be a small uh, line. Some tea locks, such as in South India, that are very, very big and thick and brightly colored.
and different sampradayas and different uh, uh, orders of devotees will wear different types of tilak too. So everyone has tilak. All devotees do. Um, uh, Bhakti and Carol ask again, is there proof of the disciplic succession that is, where is proof of record of disciplic succession that is in the Bhagavad Gita and how is it sustained for those outside of this country? The, uh, as she refers to here, the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita gives the line of disciplic succession. Mm -hmm. And this is passed on from teacher to disciple. And this can be researched for those that have the ability, just like our research is limited to the last 500 years. And we can trace through writings and readings, this devotee was the disciple of this one, and the teacher of that one, so on. In the same way, those that know where this information is can also follow the disciplic succession that's given in the Bhagavad Gita backwards in the same manner, following teacher to disciple like that. Uh, what else here? Um, Hari Bol is the name of the person asking the question. How did Ramananda Roy curb the pride of Cupid? Uh, we have time to describe Lord Chaitanya's interaction with the Balava Sampradaya. Well, um, Ramananda Roy curbing the pride of Cupid, I'm not exactly sure what pastime you're referring to there. Uh, the bulk of the pastimes of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Ramananda Roy are described in the uh, Madhya Lila. There is one description of Ramananda Roy actually being beyond the influence of Cupid because Ramananda Roy had the responsibility of training the uh, Devi Dasis. These are the young female dancers for the pleasure of Lord Jagannath in the temple. They would perform dances and he was the person that would arrange for their costumes and for their outfits and for the proper decorations and the proper dancing and teach them in this way and it describes how he was completely un um, affected by the presence of these young girls. So this may be what you're referring to as curbing the pride of Cupid. And uh, unfortunately we won't have any time today to talk about Lord Chaitanya's dealings with the uh, Balaba, with Balaba Bhatt. Um, we'll save that for another time. Um, um, there are some uh, there are some other questions here as far as persons who have a greater background in this. Uh, if you look on Christian.com and on some of the other Vaishnava sites, there's a variety of devotees that are great scholars in this regard. A couple come to mind, uh, Garuda Prabhu, um, uh, Satyaraj Prabhu. These are devotees that have a great knowledge and background and these details of the history of the Sampradaya as it goes beyond Mahaprabhu. And you can look at the writings that they've posted on these various internet sites and contact them through those means and discuss further with them. Um, so we're after 9 o'clock. Um, we're going to finish this evening. We want to thank everybody that's been in the chat room and um, asked their questions and all of you out there that have listened. And uh, we hope you've enjoyed this discussion about the life of Jayadeva Goswami. And uh, we do invite you again to join us next week, once again, for another episode in the lives of the Vaishnavacharis. Hare Krishna.